as we'll continue now with a real-world example of how um, companies help their clients comprehend and evaluate the potential of quantum and quantum-inspired technologies. I'm very glad to welcome Dr. Stefan Weiter here to the stage uh, with me. Um, he studied physics both at Würzburg and Stony Brook University, and you have a PhD in theoretical quantum physics, if I'm correct. And uh, yeah, your goal is to empower and support clients in realizing quantum technology's potential, and we're very excited to hear you talk about that today. And with that, you have the floor. Not yet? The microphone? I think you're good. Just try again. Something? Yeah, perfect. Yes. Okay, there. perfect. Okay, so good morning also from my side. Um, if you know Fujitsu and if you have been attending, attending the last Bitcoin quantum summits, you might wonder Fujitsu and uh, quantum. I know them for digital and Lila. Yes, that's right. Uh, until recently. So my name is Stefan Walter. I'm a quantum physicist myself. And that's why I'm also very excited uh, to share with you today our strategy and undertakings in uh, quantum computing. And since you also already know us from our quantum inspired technology, I will also highlight some very recent achievements and successes with this technology, Digital Anila. So Fujitsu has its roots in technology and innovation is in our DNA. Um, however, we do not want to do technology and innovation just for the sake of technology and innovation. What we really want to do is, is contribute to end-to-end -end solutions and uh, applications for our customers. This is also reflected in our technology vision, um, which also supports our purpose to make the world more sustainable by building trust in society through innovation. And to that end, we focus on seven key focus areas um, spanning various industry that are backed by our five key technologies. And with this, then, we address relevant business problems today. So that was a little bit about Fujitsu, and especially today, it is about our technology compute and especially quantum computing. And I'm going to tell you about our strategy and recent undertakings and also achievement. So at Fujitsu, we have a very strong and also diverse history in computing. So for instance, our ARM-based um, Processors are really at the heart of Fugaku, one of the world's fastest supercomputers. Um, however, as you all know, with an ever-increasing yeah, complexity of our problems, the world itself, um, classical compute technologies will soon face challenges. And we must yeah, explore, utilize new compute paradigms. For instance, application-specific hardware such as our quantum inspired technology is one possibility, there are also others. And of course, quantum computing raises high hopes um, to be <laughs> that game changer. And um, since we already investigated in quantum inspired technology, we now go the step towards real quantum technology also. Okay, so in order to yeah, contribute to really relevant problems to solve, come up with applications for our customers in the end. Um, we think it's important to address the whole technology stack of quantum computing. That means starting with quantum devices to quantum software and in the end to valuable applications of, of, of quantum, quantum computing. So we have lots of collaborations. We do this with world leading research institutions and uh, commercial partners. So for instance, with Kunasys, um, we focus on quantum chemical co computation. We have a large and, and fruitful collaboration with Professor Emerson, investigating error suppression, error mitigation techniques, and a great deal of our efforts in, in quantum error correction towards fault-tolerant quantum computing is done together with Professor Fuji at the Osaka University. And on the hardware level, we think it's, it makes sense to explore different realizations of qubits in the end, because right now no one really knows what the ultimate realization of a qubit will be. There might be yeah, 
specific realization being yeah, especially good for specific purposes. So to this end, um, we have a very strong collaboration with our partners and especially Professor Nakamura at the Riken Institute in Japan. And um, I will tell you a bit more about that. We focus on spin qubits in diamond structures with our partner from the TU Dev. And before I dive deep into our collaboration with the guys from Riken, I'll show you some recent achievements with uh, what we did together with the TU Delft and also uh, in the context of quantum error correction with Professor Fuji at Osaka. I already said, together with uh, our partners from the Netherlands, we focus on spin qubits and diamond. And one recent achievement yeah, from the last year already was the first fault-tolerant encoding gate operations and non-destructive sta stabilizer measurement of a logical qubit. Here, the logical qubit was made out of five physical qubits um, being the yeah, nuclear spins of the carbon-13 atoms. And additionally, we have two um, electron spins, one of the NV and one of the nitrogen, doing the measurements um, if errors occurred in that logical qubit. We also think that Diamond structures are a good candidate for scaling up. So we um, investigate the question how to combine light and spin in these, in these systems um, to go for larger scale quantum compute. So already also in, in the first talk, we heard that quantum error correction towards fault tolerant quantum computing I is key. Yeah? It is key for solving, attacking practical problems. However, it comes with a huge overhead. Um, so you need lots of lots of qubits. So there's always this barrier of one million. Clemens talked about four million to seven, 17 million qubits, physical qubits that you would need um, in order to uh, yeah, encode, a, attack a practical problem in quantum chemistry. So nowadays we have devices around 100 qubits, the so-called NISC area, and there's still this huge gap in between. And it is this gap that we investigate. I is there something useful that we can do with, let's say, 10,000 or 100,000 qubits? So um, conventional fault-tolerant architecture is you do error correction for each logical gate that you have. So in, in your universal gate set, you have the Clifford gates plus the T gate, and error correction for the T gate is especially nasty. It requires lots of lots of qubits and, and um, operations. Therefore, we, 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 th we, we propose a, let's say, early fault-tolerant architecture, partially fault-tolerant architecture. Um, we have three co error-corrected Clifford gates and allow for one error or for erroneous arbitrary rotational and gates. And with this, um, we've shown in that publication that it's possible already with 10,000 physical qubits to have 10 to the 7 Clifford gate operations, 10 to the 4 qubit operations, and then a qubit of encoded 64 logic qubit. So that is already quite nice that with these insights, you can already do something with lower qubit numbers. Still not that much that Clemens would need in order to <laughs> do his simulations, <laughs> but step by step. All right, so error correction is important, and now what, what, what are the demands for, for the hardware, for the chip design, etc.? Um, and if then we talk about superconducting qubits as we investigate with uh, our partners at Riken, the way to go is the surface code. And very, very crudely speaking, all the surface code needs is qubits arranged in an array. You need nearest neighbor coupling and the ability to read out and control your qubits. That could be done easily for the qubits around the edges of your chip. However, how do you address the qubits in the center of the chip? So th that, that's the question. Of course, there's a way out. Um, there's a traditional flip chip architecture uh, where you come from the top, top with another chip. However, the wire bonding to the edges of the chip then does not scale very much. Um, and you induce lots of lots of wires on, on your chip, additional wires. You have fields that you do not actually want. You induce crosstalk. 
that messes up your qubit coherence, computation, etc. Yeah. And and then this is um, then what we do differently with our architecture, um, together with Recon. So here's a schematic of it. What we have is a 2D integrated superconducting chip with the qubits on top, with readout resonators, etc. And now we do the wiring from the bottom of the chip. So this is different. So we do not have the wire bonding to the edges that induces wires, etc. So we really come from the back of the chip with coaxial cables. And here it is actually. Right now we have 64 qubits, which were developed together with our partners at Recon. Some of you might already have seen the chip through the microscope at our booth. Um, if not, please go take a look. Uh, <laughs> looks quite nice. So this is two by two um, chip. You can already see with your eye and then the microscope, you can zoom in a little bit. Okay, so with this architecture and this technique from contacting your qubits, your readout resonators, etc., from the back, you might imagine that scaling up could be done very easily and efficiently by just tiling these basic units um, together. So this gives you this enhanced scalability without actually changing your chip design. Huh? And you reduce crosstalk due to the contacts with coaxial cables. So if we zoom in a little bit and um, have a look at what our qubits look like in that unit cell of four qubits, we have four transmon qubits here with the Josephson junction uh, that you can see in white here. Here's uh, some, some nice zoom in pictures. Each qubit has its own readout resonator. It, they are all coupled to one common readout port in the middle here also contacted from the back of the chip um, and coupled to the readout resonators via this Purcell filter line here, which allows for very, very fast um, and, and, and minimal perturbing readout of the qubits. They are capacitively coupled via these, this capacitor here. Okay, so if you do uh, want to do qubit control, that's, I guess, no, no big secret <laughs> in, in these realization of qubits. Um, one qubit gates are done with Rabi oscillations. Um, two qubit gates here, in, in the case of fixed frequency qubits, um, that are dispersively coupled by this capacitor. This so-called cross resonance gate is the way to go. It is actually up to some uh, one qubit rotations similar to uh, AC not gate. You have as I said, very, very fast gates. So one qubit rotations can be done on the order of 10 nanoseconds, two qubit gates around 100, 150 nanoseconds. And the lifetime of our qubits right now are, let's say, on the order of 30 microseconds. So that's both for T1 and T2 relaxation curves. Okay, so where do we go from here? It is 2013, we have this 64 qubit chip here already. It will be announced also very soon. And very soon means you do not have to wait until Christmas for that present, um, but very, very soon, a couple of weeks. And where do we go from here? It is yeah, scaling up, see if we can do this tiling, go to higher qubit numbers, and then explore that partially fault-tolerant quantum architecture. So taking the theory idea to the chip and see if we can really do that. Meanwhile, we also have, based on our HPC ARM technology, a quantum computer simulator, a quantum circuit simulating machine, which right now is capable of simulating quantum circuits with up to 40 qubits very, very fast. Okay, so what do we right now? So <laughs> we all know with 64 qubits, you won't change the world. Um, we are also very down to earth at Fujitsu. Um, and we, we won't solve any practical problems right now with that technology. So, and that's the part that you might already know us for, quantum inspired technology. And it is, it is really a, a great opportunity to attack relevant business problems right now and today and uh, achieve an advancement um, over traditional technologies. So it is Fujitsu's Digital Anila. You might know it. Um, just a brief recap. 
It is special purpose hardware that is designed to solve one kind of problem class. It's combinatorial optimization problems. They pop up over each and every industry. And um, actually, if you look at the use case list from QTAC, lots and lots of, I think, two-thirds of the problems use cases are combinatorial optimization type of problems. So what did we do in the last year? So we have two very nice customer use cases together with the, the first one is together with the bank for smart finance, where we look into optimal feature selection, which then um, yeah, allows the bank to uh, do better machine learning models for uh, credit loan predictions. So you have lots of lots of features um, characterizing your, um, your persons that want a credit, but in the end, you actually want a model that you only train with 10 or 12 or maybe even just five features and, and, and make the decision you receive the credit or not. That was done very, very successfully um, with MediaMarkt Saturn. We also looked at the very common problem of operations research, which is called a capacitated vehicle routing. Um, I guess many of you know it. Um, and uh, with the technology and the ansatz, the approach that we took, we were able to show that we can actually bring down transportation costs by 5% uh, compared to their yeah, currently implemented um, approach and solution. What is also very nice, so one, one and a half years ago, we filed two patents together with uh, our colleagues from Deutsche Telekom. And they also very recently, I think, uh, four to six weeks ago, they actually have been granted. Um, so two patents granted in, in the context of communication networks, routing and usage distribution of, of, of in, in communication networks. Our colleagues from Osaka University also made a nice proposal and actually implementation um, tackling error correction using uh, the digital annealer device. So you can formulate the error correction problem of stabilizer code codes as an yeah, Ising problem, as a cubotype, combinatorial optimization problem, and actually use the digital annealer device as a decoder for, for, for error correction. So you see quantum inspired and, and quantum really go also hand in hand if you if you're creative. Um, with Professor Martin Klisch at the Technical University of Hamburg, we have an adult um, professor He's chair of the Institute of Quantum Inspired and Quantum Optimization. And yeah, we also work very closely with him on some uh, industrial use case applications. And some of you might have attended uh, the talk by Stefan Wegele and Fritz Schinkel yesterday on yeah, combinatorial optimization in train schedules and um, still fulfilling the timetable, um, even if some incidents happen during the travel. All right, so we have exciting times ahead of us at Fujitsu using quantum technology, addressing the whole stack of quantum. Um, also with uh, a very, I think, clever architecture for quantum processors. But we do not have to wait to address business problems right now. I've shown you, we have lots of use cases together with customers that using quantum inspired technology also allows you to advance already today. So with this, yeah, please reach out to us with questions, with problems, projects. We are very happy to talk to you. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Walter. <laughs> Thank you so much for that presentation. Again, we're at the 50 second mark, so we have <laughs> maybe time for one super quick question. Natalia has a microphone for you, so I can hear you better. Yes, uh, thank you for the talk. Um, could you comment on what the error rates uh, of your C0 gate are? <laughs> Actually, I cannot answer the question right now. All right. So we would have to wait until uh, we announce it officially. But okay. That's just the reason for that. Thank you. <laughs> right now. Well, that was the perfect question um, <laughs> regarding the time <laughs> and maybe also open opportunity for a conversation over a cup of coffee. Thank you so much for coming, Dr. Walter. Another round of applause for you. Thank you.